The Huskers nearly pull off an upset despite its special teams and O-line struggles. Hi, I'm Aaron Muller, and this is Episode 6 of the Cobb Smack Podcast. This is a Nebraska football podcast covering the Husker season and team news as it progresses throughout the year. Uh, Every video episode is available on YouTube, and the audio versions will be found on Apple, Google, or Spotify. We're going to do a recap this week of the Week 3 game against the Oklahoma Sooners. This was a big game. Um, I talked about in the preview. It's the 50th anniversary of the game of the century. Um, I didn't know how much that was going to play into the player side of things, the player perspective, since they were all like so young. They they don't don't remember so much uh, the rivalry and the history there. Um, But it was talked about. The coaches brought it up a couple of times in in press and stuff like that. And then the players talked about it afterwards. Like the the more they thought about it, the more clips they saw, the more highlights they saw of the rivalry between these two big schools, um, these big powerhouses back in the day. Like it means more after the fact, I think, more so than in the moment of each individual play. Um, going into the overall performance, I thought that the Huskers outperformed many expectations. Going into this, if you uh, were reading on Twitter or the forums or listening to the news or the national media, um, we were the 22.5-point underdogs. We were three touchdown underdogs, and we were supposed to go in there and get stomped. We might have hung with them for a half, and then we would get stomped after that. That's not what happened. We outperformed many, many people's expectations. Um, I mentioned it in the pregame, uh, on Friday that I felt like if we played clean, if we played to our potential, we could hang with them. Like that wasn't in doubt in my mind. It was, if we, if we played to what our abilities are, we, we could, we could hang in the game. Um, it did live up to the rivalry series. As I mentioned, we, we didn't quit. Nebraska never quit. We never had a point where you thought that the game was out of hand, which happens a lot. If you look back at previous games, you, you just have a moment where you're like, well, the game's out of hand now. Um, you never had that. And so that was really nice to see that we can go into a number three at their stadium in Norman, um, and you you hang with a number three team in, in the country. Uh, many people still don't, you know, they say, well, Oklahoma's overrated. They shouldn't be number three. Um, but, I mean, they are. That's just their their history there. They're, they're consistently good on offense. Um, they did drop down to number four. I don't know if that's because they played poorly or, or we hung with them, and so that looked bad on them. Um, they did drop down to number four, but regardless, they're still a top four team. Um, I, I did notice watching the game, too, that uh, especially with the fans, um, there was a lot of respect for each program. Um, all of the media and the recaps and, and or the previews and things going into the game, um, it wasn't like uh, we hate them, we hope they lose. I mean, obviously you hope your team wins, but but you didn't look at the other team and, and hope that they were bad. You wanted a good game. You wanted the best version of the opposite team to come play you, um, but to still have a good game. Um, I can think of, like, if you would compare this to a Colorado rivalry, uh, Colorado and Nebraska fans do not like each other. There's lots of talk about when you went to Colorado or you went to Boulder and your tires would get slashed or, or vice versa. Um, that's not I – don't, I don't think – that this is anything like that. I don't think that this is like an Iowa where we talk crap to the Iowa players all the time or, or the Iowa fans all the time. And it's just like a butting of heads all the time. There's a lot of respect for what each program has accomplished in the fan base and in between the coaches and between the programs themselves. Um, but I truly think that that's what the rivalry is. I was talking to one of the guys on my route. I deliver mail. <clears throat> I was talking to him and he mentioned he doesn't think this is a rivalry because there isn't that, that tension, that fighting in, in between the fan bases. Whereas in my mind, um, a rival is more someone, whether it be on a team basis or it be on a one-on-one basis, um, a rival is just someone who drives you to compete harder and you both make each other better in the process. Um, And Oklahoma certainly has done that in the past. And I hope that we can get back to the point where where they're kind of kicking us in gear to get better so that we can play them and beat them consistently. Like every time we meet each other in the future, hopefully it's more often. Um, not, I wouldn't say every year people keep saying, Oh, well, let's play Oklahoma every year. I will talk about that later, but I would like to play them more often because it seems like we drive each other to be better. Um, obviously Oklahoma thought that they were capable of coming in here and stomping us. Cause I heard, I heard some, some of their fan base specifically was mentioning that. I don't think that the coaching, uh, Lincoln Riley, I don't think the coaching staff overlooked us, but, um, the fan base certainly did. And I think a lot of the players came in here with the expectations that they were going to be able to score easily on us. 
And so this was like a, a slap in the face. This is not, not a slap in the face. This is a reality check that Oklahoma has work to do as well. Um, so in the process of us hanging with them, they, they got a gut check and they have things to work on. We have things to work on. So we're both going to get better in the process. Um, and I truly think that that's what a rivalry makes a good rivalry. Um, either way, we came in with a solid game plan and the defense uh, brought the Huskers within striking distance. They kept us within striking distance all game. Um, and, and we had a chance to win it with 50 seconds left. There was other things that went wrong in the game that would have that would have brought that gap a little closer, but um, that's just where it is. Getting into the stats, uh, we had a total of 384 yards, and they had a total of 408. We had 289 in the air and 95 on the ground. They had 214 in the air and 194 on the ground. The defense didn't have any sacks. We did get four tackles for loss, um, no interceptions, no turnovers, anything like that. Uh, they did get five sacks, which, I mean, that's not great, but I, I talked about that coming into the game that the offensive line was our weak spot and their defensive line was their strong spot on their defense. Um, our offensive line consists almost entirely of underclassmen. Uh, there is two juniors. I believe this is our first year they're getting snaps, though, so we have a lot of young guys that have a lot more to grow, a lot more room to grow, um, and I was just concerned that they weren't quite ready to go up against the defensive line almost entirely consisting of seniors and juniors. Um, so they did get the five tackle or they did get the five sacks, 10 tackles for loss, and they did get one interception. Um, it was more of a write-off interception though. It was a fourth down. Adrian had to get rid of the ball. He just kind of chucked it and hoped his guy could make a play on it. And uh, they intercepted it. It was actually not a great play. I think he was down on like the two or the three yard line. He would have been better off swatting the ball away and they would have got the better field position on like the 23 or whatever. But Going into special teams, again, we had a rough time with special teams. It was kind of a mixed bag, but but the same woes that have been plaguing us for the last few games. Um, our field goal kicker uh, went one for three. Again, this week he missed two field goals. Um, he did make one. His first one out he made, um, but then he, he kind of slipped after that. We did have a decent punt, uh, punt game. We had two punts, and they averaged 50 yards. So we brought in a different punter. He, he had a much better night. Um, or evening, I guess, afternoon, <laughs> 11 o'clock games. Um, but their special teams also, they missed one field goal, and they had four punts for 39.25 yards on average. Uh, first downs, looking at the first downs, we only had 18. They had 21. So, I mean, um, I thought last week that 19 first downs wasn't great. I thought we needed more consistency. This game, uh, I think we did hit the consistency. There just wasn't as many snaps this game. Um, we went from having 90 snaps... I was that a Fordham or Buffalo. We had 90 snaps on offense and we didn't have, we had 80 in this one or 50. We had 50 in this one. So there wasn't as many series to get the first downs on. So I think 18 was a good number to hit here. Um, uh, time of possession was pretty split evenly. It was 29. Uh, we had, we had it for 29 minutes. They had it for 30 some odd seconds. Uh, penalties is kind of what killed us though. It, uh, we kind of tightened it up towards the uh, second half, but we did have eight penalties for 70 yards. They had 70 for 70 yards. Um, but ours, as we'll get into our, yeah, that's an area of concern that we need to, we really need to buckle down on. Um, but if we look back at the takeaways from, from the preview that I had, uh, my first point was uh, top to bottom. I said that the defense needed to play a good game. Otherwise it didn't matter how well our offensive line played. I, I keep pushing the offensive line, every preview that we go into a game. Like that's my biggest area of concern for the team. Um, but if the defense didn't play well, it didn't matter what the rest of the team did. We weren't going to be able to hang with Oklahoma as they put up 70 points. So uh, the defense had to come out. They checkmarked. They did that. They did much better than most people expected. Um, they played outstanding against the best Sooner team since 2010. I've seen that a lot on Twitter. Um, seen that all over the place. That This is the best Sooner team, Sooner offense, Sooner defense, best all-around team that we would go against uh, that we've seen since 2010. Um, they held the offense to only three touchdowns. They did get 23 points total, uh, but that's still the lowest that they've had since 2016. Um, the 408 yards barely snaps the seven game streak for the defense of holding teams under 400, but 408 is still a lot better. I think it's like 130 yards under their, their season average so far. Um, and we did force four punts. They had one in total in the previous two games uh, when we forced the ball four times to get kicked. Um, and they never busted a play of more than 25 yards. I think they had their longest pass play was 23 yards, and then the longest running play was 23 yards as well. So they didn't get those big explosive plays that you're used to seeing from an Oklahoma. Um, and that was a big 
that was a big area of concern for me too. I, I was hoping they weren't going to gash us every once in a while. And, and we certainly tightened up that. That was a beautiful thing to see. Uh, Eric Schneider made a great game plan. It seemed like he kept everything underneath, uh, let them get the short yardage, but then don't let them bust out a big play on you. And they held to that. Um, their quarterback averaged uh, coming into the game. Their average was 74% completion rate on passing. They averaged 330 and a half yards per game rushing or passing. Uh, and they only hit 214 in this game. So uh, both of those things, I think he, he went 24 for 34. Um, and they only hit the 214 in the air. So, I mean, that's it's a pretty significant drop in their average numbers there. Uh, they are 100, yeah, 120 yards under their season average for total yards as well. Um, and they were coming into this game uh, tied for first, I believe, with Auburn at 58 points per game. Uh, we held them to 23. So that, that's half, essentially. Um, that's more than half. So, so coming into the game, a lot, so I think that's why a lot of people expected them to just come out and score at will. And to hold a team that, that was first in the FBS at 58 points per game to only 23 points, uh, and, and really the offense only scored 21 of those points, uh, that's a very significant thing to see. Um, a lot of people were debating whether this was just an overrated Sooner team or an underrated Nebraska team. I think it might be a little bit of both. I don't think that the Huskers are as bad as the record shows. I mentioned that coming into the game. Um, but I don't think the Sooners are quite to that number three level yet. They, they had the rank in front of their name. They had that number three in front of their name. But I just don't think that they were there yet. Uh, Spencer Rattler, he, he made plays in the game, but he also seemed to struggle a little bit. There was about three times that I can remember specifically where uh, Luke Reimer had a chance at a jump ball, uh, kind of went right into his hands. Um, Cam Taylor had a, a chance at a pick. There was three chances where we could have easily had a pick in the game, and they just never came down with it. We needed to come down with those. Those could have been major turning points in the game. Um, it's just he had, he had moments where he struggled, and we could have capitalized on it, but it just didn't come, didn't come to fruition. Um, my second key from the game from the preview was that our old line needed to play consistently and they needed to be able to hold and give Adrian time. And they struggled once again, uh, junior Trent Hickson came in to start over Ethan Piper. Ethan Piper has been somebody I brought up a couple different times this year. Um, he was the worst graded lineman we had per, uh, pro football focus, um, by, by their stats, like how many people he's letting through, how many times he's getting beat, how many times people are rushing around him how many sacks he's giving up, that type of thing. Ethan Piper is only a sophomore, though. So, I mean, he's going to have time to grow. But but typically, if you look back at traditional Huskers, people are like, what's wrong with this offensive line? It's because this is the youngest offensive line historically that Nebraska has had. We have a ton of freshmen, a ton of sophomores, and a couple juniors, which Trent Hickson got his start this week. But um, we have a couple juniors by name, but they haven't actually had the experience of a junior either. So uh, Trent Hickson came in over Ethan Piper. Uh, to start the game, though, our first two snaps before we even got a playoff, we had two false starts in a row. Um, that's on the offensive line. We had two more penalties that drive as well. Uh, Cam uh, Cam Jurgens had one for like uh, like being too aggressive. He shoved a guy to the ground and kind of went back on top of him, so he got an unnecessary roughness pass and then uh, play penalty. And then we also had another offensive um, false start. So we had four penalties in the first offensive drive that totaled 30 yards um, overall in the game out of our eight penalties six of those were on the offensive line every single one of our starting offensive linemen had a penalty on them Cam Jurgens got two uh, his second his second um, unnecessary roughness penalty you can go back and look at the video in there I'll try to throw stuff up as I get it but that that one was iffy to me I feel like that was just a football play there was a couple different times where where our guys kind of get flagged or, or penalized for something where it's just a football play. And I hate to see the officiating kind of taking the heart out of the game. You want to see those. That's like what you look for. You look like for hard nosed football. And that's all it was to me is he shoved a guy and the guy went flying. That's just cam being strong as hell. So, um, uh, freshman Turner Corcoran and junior Trent Hickson had a rough time though, specifically, uh, combined. They had eight hurries on, on Adrian. They allowed two sacks. They had two penalties each. One of them gave up a tackle for a loss, but they had um, Teddy, uh, Teddy Prohaska. A lot of people thought he was going to come in on line, on the line itself, but he came in as a tight end to add extra blocking for rushing or run game. Um, and he seemed to do really well. He seemed when he came in, he graded really high as far as his ability to block for the rush game. 
Um, so I can see a lot more of that coming in going forward. Uh, I remember listening to the post game that uh, Alex Grinch, their defensive coordinator, he said that they hadn't seen that from Nebraska coming in, and so that kind of threw him for a loop, but it seemed to be effective. We had two tight ends on the field, um, and he's a big guy himself, Teddy Prochaska is. Um, and I'm, I apologize if I say Prochaska and it's Prochaska. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I've heard it both ways. But um, seeing both the tight ends, we had uh, Austin Allen and Travis Volkolek both back, so that was nice to see. But to have Teddy Prochaska come in as a blocker as well, um, it was just nice. I can see a lot more of that. I can see that going forward, that we they would run a lot more of those wrinkles. Um, but Martinez did get pressured 50% of his snaps. He dropped back 36 times. Um, so he got pressured on 18 of those. They gave up five sacks and two of those were in the final drive. Uh, we had a chance to come back with 50 seconds left to score a touchdown. And I, I was trying to play out in my head. If we made the touchdown, would we go for two points to win it? Or would we kick the field goal, tie it? But with the way our kicking game has been going, I think we would have went for two points there. So, but regardless, we didn't even get a chance to see that come to fruition because uh, on the first and 10, first play of the 50-second comeback drive, we got sacked, and then on the third down, we got sacked as well. So you can't be giving up those. I'm sure we've run these drills over and over again, but but like I said, they were going against a, a very good defensive line, um, and our guys are just young and not experienced enough for that. So um, the another note that I had was the penalties. So again, the penalties, that was my third key of the game. Um, Penalties kind of go back to the offensive line as well. So the offensive line kind of nailed two of my keys to win the game. They kind of threw those out the window. So um, if we could have just had one of those two go right, if the offensive line could have been protecting but still get those penalties, because even despite the penalties, we still played really well. We still played. I mean, there was times where Adrian had time to throw the ball, and, th and those were great plays. We made big passing uh, plays when we needed them. Uh, but there was just too many times where the pocket collapsed and we didn't get it. And then, and then the penalties added on top of that poor performance really, really put the nail in the coffin for us. And then my fourth key, I don't typically do four keys, but I did have one in the preview that I said, Martinez also had to play well. We couldn't allow any turnovers. Um, and this is the first game that he didn't have the most rushing yards on the team. Ramir Johnson came in and he had a good evening. We had a, a cycle of three or four running backs again, like we usually do. Gabe Irvin came in, um, but Ramir Johnson came in. He seemed to be the main back we were running with. He had 11 carries for 42 yards. He was running a 3.8 average carry. Um, Gabe Irvin did come in for nine carries. He had 18 yards only, but he got injured in the third quarter. Um, and it was a non-contact injury. He kind of made a cut and he like immediately went down and grabbed his knee. So that's not great. Whenever you see that he didn't even get hit, uh, that's typically not a good sign. So, um, he had the non-contact injury. He was on crutches after the game. Um, and Scott Frost, when asked about it, he said that it looks like he could l miss a little bit of time. So, uh, I hope that he gets better. He's going to be a monster for us going forward. Um, but for the moment, Ramir Johnson looked good in the game and his, his pass blocking was also decent. I went back and watched the game and the amount of times that he was picking up defend, uh, defenders running through or blitzes, he, he just does really well as far as pass protection goes for Martinez. Um, outside of that, Martinez had 323 total yards. He had two touchdowns, one in the air, one on the ground. Um, and he did have one interception, which was the only turnover of the game. So, so his turnover, you know, everybody rips him for turnovers and everybody kind of rips the team for turnovers in general. There was only one turnover in the whole game from either team. And it was a throwaway interception. Like I said, it was a fourth down. He kind of tossed it up and hoped somebody could make a play, but he had to get rid of the ball anyway. So it was a throwaway interception. The guy made a great play on it. If you go back and watch it, he, he shouldn't have probably caught it, but, but it was still a joy to watch. Even if you're not, you know, even if it was against Nebraska, it was still a great play to see as a college football fan. Um, other than that, oh, uh, under 20 yards, he was perfect. He was 16 for 16 on passes under 20 yards. Over 20 yards, he was throwing 50%, so it's still not terrible. He went three for 16. Um, and one of the other things I mentioned was that, that we would have great success on play action if we could get the running game going. The running game still kind of struggled. We, we didn't even hit 100 yards this game, um, but the play action still worked really well because. Uh, they were still worried about Adrian possibly taking off as well. So he went nine for 11 on play actions. Um, and so that, that worked really well as I thought it would. I thought we'd do a, little more, a few more screen passes as well, but uh, that didn't seem to happen. Um, as I mentioned, the special teams was a mixed bag. Uh, Connor Culp came in and he did make his first 51 yard field goal. Um, after that, he missed a 50 yarder, which I'm not going to put that on him from that distance. It's kind of a toss up anyway. And uh, the 50 yarder that he missed, I believe just kind of, dinked off of the right uh right upright so he wasn't even that far off 
But then he came in after that to kick a short 35-yard field goal that was right in the center of the field, and he missed it again. These chip shots that he should be making are the ones that's killing his confidence. Um, and, I, and I think it did so much so that Scott Frost mentioned that he, he saw the way that Connor looked after he missed that short one, um, and he pulled in the freshman, Kellen Meyer, to come in and could kick the point after because he was so concerned that Connor was in such a bad mind space that he was going to miss the point afters as well. Turns out that, that was a terrible idea because Kellen Meyer had his point after blocked and they returned it for two points. That's three swing points that came into play majorly at the end of the game. Um, those two missed field goals, too. That's, I mean, that's a total of nine swing points and they only won by seven. So you can point to the special teams and say they lost us the game. I'm going to still point more towards the offensive line because if you have an offensive line that holds well and is able to rush the ball, I don't think we have to kick the field goals to begin with. So um, it's still nice to be able to rely on your kicker to get those chip shots in. But, but again, I think more people are pointing to the special teams as being an issue because it's been the most consistent thing for us. Whereas the offensive line, once they get solidified, then we can work on special teams. I think fixing special teams first and letting the offensive line still slide the way that they have been performing, um, that's just the wrong uh, thing to prioritize. But again, prioritize uh, whatever you want. One of those two has to get better. Um, a lot of people are pointing to the special teams. Um, we did bring in William Pristup. I, again, if I say his name wrong, I apologize. Uh, William Pristup, he came in over the uh, Cerny, who Cerny has been kicking for us recently for punt game. Um, but he looked injured. He seemed to have ice on his knee. So he never even came into the game. But he punted well. So he, like I said, he averaged 50 yards per punt, and his punts looked good. So I can see him going, uh, being the guy going forward. He is a sophomore. Maybe he has some more experience than Cerny does, and they were hoping that Cerny would come in. Maybe he looked better in practice. I'm not sure. But I can see Prista being the guy going forward to kick our, our punts. Um, but like I mentioned, that the, the uh, point after in the field goals really made a difference. So a lot of people are harping on that. Um, but if, if we make the field goals and the point after, then we're up by two instead of down by seven. So that, that, that's, a big, that's a big swing. Uh, and that seems to be how most of our games are. There's always like a few key plays that, that determine the outcome of the game. Um, and that's just how it is. Uh, what does the win loss mean for the team? Despite the offensive line and the special teams struggling, uh, there was a lot of positive to see. Um, there was a lot of fight. They competed all four quarters. Like I said, they hung around with the third ranked team in the nation. Um, and then uh, I'll think a lot of the, a lot of the penalties that came early in the game, there was uh, one on, I don't remember who it was pulled out. One of our safeties, um, he kind of did the same thing as as uh, Jurgens, where he he kind of unnecessarily like put too much aggression into a play when he didn't have to after the play was over. And I think that was mostly just an emotional reaction. Uh, before the game even started, there was a tussle up on the field where Oklahoma's players kind of went over the fifty yard line and kind of got in our faces, our players' faces. Uh, I remember Scott Frost and Tre uh, Trev Alberts talking about it, that they were wondering why the offici uh, officials weren't stopping that to begin with. Because um, the only thing between Oklahoma team and the Husker team was the Husker staff. So um, I think they were upset that that even started up. There was a lot of jawing going on down on the field. And I think that kind of carried over into the game because after, after about halftime, we didn't really see as much of that. We tempered the emotions and we played solid football from that point on. Um, as I mentioned, though, like I am proud of the way the football team uh, played as a football fan, as a Nebraska fan. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that they played the way they played because that, that just carries on uh, a perception across the nation that we're not a team that's just going to get smoked. We're not a team that's going to give up on a play. We are playing more solid football. It's the little things we're doing right. The little things we're improving on. People aren't seeing the wins yet, but I think that we're still a terrible team. But I mean, even the players and the coaches that go against us are saying that that's not their 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 record is not reflective of how that team plays. Um, the Fox Big Noon Saturday that after the game, they were they seemed to be pretty high on Nebraska themselves. Bob Stoops specifically, which I, I took more credit from this because uh, he's Oklahoma's coach. He's the one that took him to a national championship. He said Scott Frost and the Nebraska team was not given enough credit coming into the game, and they played much better. He they played their hearts off. Um, uh, Alex Grinch himself, so their defensive coordinator on Martinez, he he said that we thought we could make him beat, uh, make him beat you with his arm was their game plan. Make him beat you with his arm, and he dang near did. 
Uh, and so he gives him a ton of credit for that. He, he also, you could tell that there was like a bit of respect between him and Scott, Scott Frost and um, Lincoln Riley and our defensive coordinator as well. Eric Schneider seemed to talk very highly on each other. So it was kind of a battle of the offense versus defense on both sides. I mentioned there being a ton of parallels coming into the game between the two programs. And that was one of them that our offensive coordinators respected their defensive coordinators and vice versa. So, um, he, he didn't mention though, uh, Alex Grunch did mention that he, he liked the way that Scott Frost called the game. He thought Scott Frost called a good game. Uh, the way he, he gave the looks, the looks on offense that he wasn't expecting to see the wrinkles that he ran. Um, he makes it very difficult for a defense to play well against that. Um, uh, Joel Klott, for instance, Joel Klott's one of my favorite guys nationally that you see on a big scale, a big stage. Um, he seems to always give Nebraska a fair shake. He might be critical, but it's always with a, like a constructive side to it. And he, he addressed the fans after the game as well. He was like, Nebraska fans, I'm telling you, it's this close. It's on a razor's edge. Uh, he went in to say that, that in the last eight games, the losses that we have, uh, we lost by a total of 28 points. So we are 28 points from being on an eight game winning streak. And that would change drastically the perception that people have of the program. Um, people are just tired of losing these one possession games, these one, uh, you know, one score games, but we're that close. It's so much better than getting beaten out by 30 points. Um, but, but he went on even further to say that, that this team is going to beat Michigan, Ohio state, Iowa, or Wisconsin. He didn't say we might, he said that we will get one of those teams. The way we played today, I think, made a big impact on the national perception of how Nebraska is as a program. Um, we're no longer the team that's going to back down and slip. And uh, we do make mistakes. We're still working on that, but we are a team that fights, and we have a lot of playmakers on the field. So I think looking forward, uh, we do have Michigan State coming up. It is in East Lansing. It's an away game, and it is at night. It's at 6 p.m. Um, so that's not going to be easy. East Lansing's not an easy place to go into at night and win especially the way Michigan state's been playing. They've been playing really well lately. Um, but I, I feel confident going into the rest of the schedule, the way we played Oklahoma state um, or Oklahoma, Oklahoma has a lot of dudes. As I mentioned, they have a lot of talent on the field. So if we were able to hang with them, there's, there's nothing saying that we shouldn't hang with the rest of the people on the schedule. The rest of the programs on the schedule are big 10. Yes. It's all conference play from here on out, but we have, one, two, we have five of the next, we have five games on the remaining schedule that are at home. Uh, that should give you the advantage there. Big 10 is big, uh, but they're not necessarily all as deeply talented as Oklahoma's roster was. Um, top to bottom, they're going to have playmakers, yes, but they're, they're going to be big, yes. The Huskers are big. We have playmakers as well, so we should be able to match up it's not so much about talent anymore as it is about effort. And I think we got the effort part down. So um, Luke Reimers after the game kind of echoed what Scott Frost had shared with the players as well. He said that everything that you want to accomplish is still in front of you. Um, and they believe they can win out completely. Like that was, that was the end of the thing. He believes they can win out. Um, and that shows a ton of confidence uh, between the players and, and the coaching staff as well. Obviously as a player and, and a coaching staff, you would hope that they have confidence going in. But you could just see Luke talking about it, like everything they want to accomplish is still ahead of us. It wasn't like a down and out mentality. Yes, they're kind of bummed out that they lost, but they're proud of the way they played. It wasn't like a we kind of turned over and, and you know, just took a loss. We fought for a win and we just came short. So I think going into the rest of the season, that, that should give you a little more confidence with every matchup going forward. Um, after the way they played, the, like I said, the talent was matched with effort on our side. And there wasn't as big of a talent gap because we played hard, because we played consistently, um, and because our game plan going in was solid. Um, obviously, there's some things to clean up. We, uh, I mentioned um, that we had uh, trouble at the end of the game. Uh, there was a different kind of trouble that we had during the game as well. There was a couple times where we had to burn a timeout early, um, early in a drive, or after, I think it was Xavier Betts had a big play. We moved down the field. Um, and it seemed to be a lot of confusion on the offense and Adrian kind of had to take it and run. He only got a yard. It seemed like a wasted play. I didn't know if it was busted or not. Um, but Scott Frost mentioned after the game that it wasn't so much a busted play between what he told Adrian to run. So it goes from Scott Frost to the play caller with the cards. And then Adrian reads off of that. Um, there was a communication error somewhere in the line and 
the, the play that Scott Frost called didn't get to Adrian, and Adrian, rather than calling a timeout that they desperately needed to save for the end of the game, uh, he decided just to run and try to see what he could get with it. Um, props to Adrian for taking an initiative and not burning a timeout, but something's got to be cleaned up as far as the communication goes, whether that be giving Adrian more freedom to choose the play you're running, or if Scott Frost still wants to maintain that, we need to clean up whatever issue there is on the communication side. Make sure the players are getting there early or have a series drawn up beforehand to take out into the field. Um, but regardless, it gives confidence heading into conference play. All the games from here on out are conferences. Uh, we play away at Michigan State next, and then we play at home for Northwestern and Michigan, then away at Minnesota, and then Purdue and Ohio State at home. So we have a ton of big games that we typically would struggle with, but they're going to be in Memorial Stadium, so we'll have the home field advantage. Northwestern plays us hard. Michigan plays us hard. Ohio State, obviously, is going to play us hard. Um, and then Iowa. At the end of the year, we play Iowa, and that's at home as well. So a lot of big games we have coming up, we play at home. We do play Minnesota and Wisconsin away. Um, and like I mentioned, Michigan State's away. So we have three big games on the road yet. But we went into Norman, and we played Oklahoma very hard and very solidly and consistently. We just need to clean up some of the rough edges, um, and we'll, we will have a shot at any of these games. Um, but I hope that the fan base got a shot of excitement and hope that they can compete again. I know that a lot of people were down and out. I, it's kind of a split, too, between the older fan base that knows how the Huskers used to be. They kind of want a black and white we win or we lose. They don't really care about the improvements on the little things because those are the only two things that they really pay attention to. Whereas the people that are younger and we're kind of, we grew up now with a mediocre Nebraska team. We have to take the improvements as victories because we don't have these big championships to hold on to. And remember, we don't have any of that. We have these little small victories. The offensive line is going to get better. The wide receivers are getting better and bigger. The quarterback is, is amazing. And he's a dual threat quarterback. Um, the defense is playing out of their minds that Eric Shenander is doing a great job on defense. I'm actually slightly afraid that he's going to leave, but I think the split there is the, the older fan base that has all these championships in this historical run that we had in the nineties. They have that to hold on to. Whereas the rest of us don't remember that. We don't remember this Nebraska being strong. We heard about it, but we grow up and we have been watching a Nebraska team that's mediocre. Uh, we might win nine games, and that's a good season for us. So so our idea of success is not a win-loss straight up. Um, obviously, you want wins, but our, our idea of success is improving every game. Um, offensive line, defense, quarterback, wide receivers, rushing game, anything is an improvement that can be a success. So I hope that the fan base as a whole got a shot of excitement um, and that we look forward to the rest of the schedule now instead of being worried about if we're going to make a bowl game I think there's a real shot now. I think that, I mean, I thought that to begin with, I thought that we had a chance to play in games. I just needed to see more as far as effort. And we've seen a ton of effort at Oklahoma. So um, if we can just keep the effort up, keep the heart up, keep the confidence up, then I think we have a good shot. Um, but that's going to wrap up this week's recap. We will be back here on Friday for the pregame analysis of the Michigan State game. Um, if you had any comments, if you liked anything that I said in the video, if you had anything that you didn't quite agree with, uh, let me know down below in the comments, or you can tweet me at CobsmackPod on Twitter. I do stream on Twitch as well at The Shadows. Um, so until next time, go Big Red.